Hello everyone and welcome to this, the latest webinar in UK Research and Innovations Net Zero series from the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund. Today's webinar is all about sustainable energy towards a sustainable future. And it's being done viewed through the lens of activities in the Prospering from the Energy Revolution programme, which I run as Challenge Director. The Prospering from the Energy Revolution programme, it's addressing issues like, how can we put together net zero energy in intelligent ways for people so that it suits them? What's the role of data in doing this? How do we engage people in decarbonising? How does our infrastructure need to change through our transition? What business models will emerge that help us to do all of this? What's the role of local areas in delivering net zero? And what's going on at the cutting edge of technology and integration right now? So today's webinar has a fantastic set of speakers who are going to tell us about some of those issues, what we're learning and what we're seeing on the ground in projects right now. Before we get to them, just a couple of housekeeping um, pieces. Firstly, we really want you to take part in this, to ask questions of our speakers. There's going to be a discussion half an hour at the end, and we want your questions to play a part in that. Please put your questions in the Q&A, not in the chat. So questions in the Q&A, thanks. And finally, um, this is the penultimate in our series of webinars. There's one more on Thursday, which is not to miss, which is kind of a wrap up across all of the ISF challenges dealing in net zero, where you'll hear from the challenge directors on what they've learned about running big innovation projects in net zero. So that's 11 a.m. on Thursday for the final one of this series of webinars. Okay, let's get over to our speakers. Um, and the first speaker we've got today is Sam Hampton from the Oxford Institute for Environmental Change, Oxford University. Um, Sam looks particularly into um, societal uh, issues and societal interactions with our transformation to net zero. And he's working as part of one of our demonstrator projects, the Energy Superhub Oxford um, project. So we're gonna hear um, briefly from Sam on what's going on there. Over to you, Sam. Okay, thank you. I'll just uh, share my slides. Okay, great. Um, yes, yeah, so thank you for that introduction. Um, as, as you say, I'm uh, working on Energy Superhub Oxford, uh, which, is a, which is quite a technical project, lots of, I'm working alongside lots of engineers and software developers and, and technical specialists, and, and I'm the kind of social scientists in the team, um, really flagging up the, uh, the human side of the project. So I'm, that's what I'll focus on today. Um, and because I've only got seven minutes, I'm going to zoom straight into flexibility as a concept, um, because, you know, as, as many of you will know, it's a key, uh, a key component of a future smart, low, low carbon energy system. Um, and, and of course, you know, just to very briefly cover why we need it. Well, at the moment, when we when we think about meeting peak demand of electricity, um, then uh, which is in this country is between say four and seven p.m., then we we typically meet that peak demand with fossil fuel uh, power stations, which we call peaker plants. And as we get our electricity um, generation away from fossil fuels, we need alternative ways of meeting those uh, peaks of demand and and of storing um, renewable energy from solar and wind. Um, so there are different ways to do that. And on this project, we're, we're exploring lots of different uh, method, methods for doing so. And the first one is, is highly technical, doesn't really involve people very much other than the kind of uh, uh, energy traders and, and clever programmers. And this is a very large battery that we're installing um, on the transmission network just outside Oxford. It's composed a 50 megawatt battery uh, composed of lithium ion and, and vanadium flow battery as well. So as you can imagine, I don't get very involved in that element of the project. Um, and then as we go through the project, there are other, other bits. So we're also um, thinking about decarbonizing or electrifying transport. Um, and, and we're working with Oxford City Council to, um, to electrify some of their fleet, uh, some of the more un unconventional electric vehicles. And this is an example of a, a fancy 
brand new electric tipper truck. Um, and what's different about this, you know, essentially it does the same job as a diesel truck, but it's, it's much heavier because of the battery. Um, and of course it has a very um, significant uh, load of uh, demand for electricity. So we need to think carefully about when we charge that, um, that vehicle. So we want to avoid charging it during peak demand. We, we don't want to make the, the uh, grid capacity problems in Oxford, which, which are apparent in Oxford, um, any worse. Um, and also there are human elements in terms of thinking about shift patterns. We wanna make sure that it's fully charged overnight. And then we might also have another charge over lunchtime um, so that the team are ready to go again in the afternoon and then not charging in peak demand. Um, and then a bit more on the, the human side is, is a side of the project um, where we're looking at decarbonizing heating. And we're installing ground source heat pumps in social housing in Oxford. Um, and of course, this is a, a great technology. Um, it, it, it involves drilling 100 meter holes in people's front gardens um, to at, make use of that latent heat that lives in, uh, that sits in under the earth. Um, and we're using highly efficient uh, heat pumps to, to uh, pump that heat inside uh, tenants' homes. Um, but what we're trying to do with this again it, it's it's electricity so you know we're bringing the picture here is we're using more and more electricity and and we already have an issue in terms of how do we meet peak demand so part of the answer is making sure that we don't add to peak demand and and so what we're doing is trying to use um create a system where those heat pumps are used flexibly and so here's a schematic where you have the heat pumps in the bottom right and the, the thermostat is, is, sits in the, in the property. And behind that, it, the company that, that runs, that operates those is called Switchy. They've got a database uh, um, of, of information which they can uh, draw from those uh, thermostats. So that it's really valuable to landlords, for example, because it will tell them if particular tenants are underheating their homes or, or overheating and it can flag up issues. Um, and so what, what Kenza, who are the manufacturers of the heat pump and a partner on our project, what they're trying to do is build a link between that set, that piece of software and, uh, and, and, and a special time of use tariff um, offered by Octopus Energy. This is a tariff of electricity um, where the price changes every, um, every half an hour. And as you can imagine, it's more expensive between 4 and 7 p.m. So, so put simply, what they're trying to do is operate uh, the heat pumps to, to be optimized for price. So what that might mean is, is the heat pump is, is turned on at 2 p.m. Um, and, and, and then turned off at 4 p.m. But the idea is that it, it will maintain a, a comfortable temperature during those peak, peak hours. Now, that's, again, a very technical system, um, and, and that's all going on in the background. But there is obviously a human side to all of this. Um, people have different needs when it comes to thermal comfort. Um, and and, there are, and there's, a, there's a spectrum here of, of do we want um, the, the system, the heating system to be completely highly automated by these complicated, clever pieces of software all talking to each other um, and, and communicating with the heat pump and being optimized for price? Or do we want people a bit more involved? Um, there might be some tenants who are kind of happy as long as they, they, there's a, a, a consistent good temperature in their homes, they're happy for it to be um, optimized by the system. But then there are obviously some um, issues with that. So for example, really simply, if someone went on holiday, um, they, they would need to be able to turn it off and say, well, there's no point optimizing it for price at the moment. I don't want it on at all. Um, and then different people will have working patterns or night shifts where they might want to, um, influence uh, or uh, adapt that schedule so so you, you know beginning to think that actually we do need to involve people on this journey and then of course at the other end of the spectrum the if they're on a time of use tariff um, they want to also make the most of um of the fact that that price prices fluctuate and so they might want to avoid using other energy intensive uh, appliances like washing machines during peak demand and for that they actually need to kind of engage with this whole price dynamic and and flexibility and and so there's a there's a real spectrum here between kind of one end of this extreme which is highly automated and one end of the um, end of the spectrum which is really driven by people and and their behaviors and and flexibility practices so that's those are some of the kind of uh, questions and tensions that we're exploring on the project and i think i will leave it there thank you great thanks sam really interesting um view into some of the activities going on in oxford um, so you're, you're busy drilling 100 metre holes in people's front gardens. How's that going down? 
Um, well, yeah, it, it went down pretty badly at the start. Um, but actually, we talk, I've been talking to people a kind of six, nine months later, um, and the pain of all of that noise and disruption is gone. And they are absolutely delighted with, with their systems. And um, most people are reporting having saved about 50% on their energy bills. So they're really happy set of tenants. Wow, that is huge, isn't it? 50%. And how much of that, Sam, is down to just the system itself and how much of it is down to kind of the flexibility and the interaction with the agile tariff um you know that that kind of whole supply system yeah so so most of that at, at the moment is is just because we're replacing electric storage heaters um and uh and, and actually, you know, although storage heaters are meant to be on economy seven and benefit from cheaper overnight tariffs, we actually found that lots of uh, people weren't using them for that because they just simply, even, even so, even if they were on economy seven, they'd just be really expensive. People were quoting five pounds a day just to use their storage heaters. Um, and these are, you know, these are low income uh, social housing tenants, um, as many of whom, whom are in, in fuel poverty. So it's been brilliant just to give them a better system. And we're beginning to monitor how, how flexibility might add to that. And, and of course, that is a really important thing because it's, it's quite easy to beat a storage heater on cost, but it's much more difficult to beat gas, uh, or it has been until gas prices went through the roof. Um, and so actually this flexibility it is going to be really important when kind of convincing people that, to get rid of their gas boilers and replacing with heat pumps. So that's part of the broader um, goal here. Okay, interesting. And um, yeah, I mean, the, the recent spike in prices and the whole supply market chaos that we've seen over the last month, um, that's had quite a big impact on this time of use agile tariff that Octopus have been running. It's quite expensive at the moment, isn't it? Yeah. Can we really expect people to kind of take up the vagaries of, 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 the, um, of the agile tariffs, especially if they're, you know, fuel poor already? Yeah. How, do we, how do we cope with these kind of fluctuations? Yeah. That, that's a, been a real challenge. And, and the trouble with, with uh, this is that agile is pe pegged to the wholesale price, essentially. So, so the, the high cost of elect electricity that we've seen in the last couple of months have just been simply passed on to uh, people who are on agile, whereas other people might be on fixed tariffs, and so it's going to take longer for those higher prices to pass through. So at the moment, we have we have literally stopped advising people to go into agile because it's not in their interest. But um, Octopus and other suppliers do provide some other tariffs. So there's one called Go and Go Faster, which um, which is actually targeted for electric vehicle users. To they, you can charge your car for five p overnight, but actually. If you, um, we, we think that there will be some benefits to heat pump users. If you ha have that period of, of, of 5p pricing, say finishing at 7 a.m., which I think one of the GO um, tariffs offers, then at least you could use your, your heat pump um, in the early morning and then it will you know, maintain a nice temperature for you when you wake up. Um, but yeah, it's a real issue um, and actually raises questions about how the whole electricity retail market is structured in a way, because another disappointment is that you know, in the three years we've been doing this program, there still is only one time of use tariff available. You know, where, where's the competition? So yeah, there is, we're, we're going faster than the market in a way. Yeah, indeed, lots of Lots of questions the last month has raised, which maybe we can discuss a bit later in the discussion section. Thank you, Sam. Uh, really interesting stuff. We look forward to talking more with you um, later on. For now, we're going to move to uh, Marika. Marika is the head of innovation for the Prospering from the Energy Revolution program and is going to tell us of, about a few light bulb moments that we've had um, from the program in the past three years. Over to you, Marika. Yeah, can you uh, all see this? Sorry. Yeah, good. Fantastic. So thank you, uh, Rob, for the introductions. Um, I'm just going to give everyone a little bit of an overview um, about the Prospering from the um, Energy Revolution uh, program that we've been running for the uh, past couple of years. And I want to focus a little bit on the light bulb moments. What, what are some of the sort of key messages coming out of the program? What have we learned from um, sort of running the program?
So the net zero challenge, um, obviously we all know uh, we, need, we, we, we would like to reach net zero as quickly as possible, ideally by 2050. And what is required is of course radical change. Um, and that includes uh, new approaches um, to how we manage our energy. Um, and obviously there's huge opportunity in smart um, integrated local um, systems. Um, and Sam's already explained um, really what flexibility services are, but we often get asked, what are, what, are, what are you actually talking about when you say smart local energy systems? And I think uh, quite early on in the program, we were asked, uh, we asked the question as part of the Energy Ref Consortium, what are smart local energy systems? And it's, it's not that easy to answer. I think there's a couple of key parameters though um that uh, i just would like to mention very briefly um to help with the definition of this so first of all we have a sort of national energy system at the moment and there's of course a need to move towards a more um sort of local system and the reason why that is is um we need to change um you know so the sources of energy um so at the moment um it's fossil fuels um sort of in, in large parts obviously there's big change happening um, in, in, in sort of renewable energy coming on board with that. And because of the fact that renewable energy isn't always available, um, obviously there's a need to generate it as closely as possible to where you need it, to possibly store it and to also then manage um, uh, the demand. So optimizing supply and demand. And that's really what smart local energy systems are all about. Um, and as part of the program, uh, we're looking at a wide range of um, projects, um, you know, new technology um, solutions, trials, demonstration projects, design projects, um, with the purpose really to, to give consumers cleaner, cheaper energy and building local prosperity. Right, I'm really local. sorry to, in to interrupt. Yeah. Could you just flip your display? We're seeing your presenter view rather than the full side view. Yeah, I'm sorry. Let me just try and do that again. Is that better now? Is that better, Rob? Sorry. Uh, that that's we're not seeing um, the presentation mode, but that'll be fine, I think. As it, okay, as it is I apologise. I don't know. Don't worry, I'll There's be some fine. Technical issues. I apologise for that. <laughs> so the power of local. Um, more than half of the emissions cuts needed, well, rely on people and businesses taking up low, low carbon solutions, um, and we've heard this in the previous presentation already. So. Um, really important the decisions that are made are um, being made at the local and individual level. And we've been thinking quite a bit about, um, you know, some of the policies um, that we have in place at the moment um, for low carbon. Um, top down policies go some way to delivering change, but you can achieve a far greater impact if they're focused through local knowledge and networks. And obviously this is a sort of thought from the Committee for Climate Change, and I just wanted to reiterate here how important the power of local is. Prospering from the Energy Revolution um, is a, a programme that's run by UK Research and Innovation. Uh, it's part of the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund. Um, it's 102 million of public funding. Um, it's matched by industry. It's um, the biggest program in this space um, at the moment. And it's running from 2019 to 2023. And we've got over 50 projects around the UK. The aim is really to show what works in this space and to learn from it and to develop um, future uh, policy to support um, smart local energy systems. PIFA in numbers, um, as I said, 102 million of um, public funding um, and uh, extra investment as well is expected from um, industry and partners. Um, we always ask for co-investment into all of our projects and that brings you up to a total of 380 million overall. 50 uh, plus projects. And I think the key thing here to say as well is that it's, it involves um, consortia and a wide range of um, sort of stakeholders. Um, so we have everything ranging from the private to the public sector um, and also universities included in all of this. Raika, I'm sorry, your slides aren't moving for some reason. Um, could we... <laughs> could I apologize we for that. Uh, let me just try and come out again and yeah. see whether I can start. If I stop share and try again, I apologize for this, everyone.
Right. Can you see the project locations now, Rob, by any chance? Yes, I can. You can, okay. So I'll continue with the presentation. Please do tell me if it doesn't move. I, okay. I can't see it on my screen. <laughs> Apologies okay. for that. So these are the project locations. Um, this, this is where all of our uh, PIFA projects are. So we have um, three large um, demonstrators. So these are more multi-million pound um, projects um, to really demonstrate um, possible solutions um, in the smart local energy um, space. We have concept designs, detailed designs. Um, they're really trying to um, work out um, how to best um, plan and implement um, smart local energy systems. And a good example here is um, Greater Manchester local energy market. Um, obviously, it's a big locality, you know, it's a big city, Manchester, and then obviously Greater Manchester combined authorities, uh, a number of um, you know, districts involved in this. And what they're trying to work out is, is really a plan for. Um, how to implement smart local energy systems. Um, and whilst this sounds fairly easy, it actually isn't in practical terms because you have to consider all of your assets. Where are the based, um, you know, where are the heat loads um, and how can you optimize supply and dem demand at the local level? And this project is, is working out, if you like, the big energy master plan that's required to, to move forward with this. Um, Obviously, uh, we've already heard about Project LEO, so I'm just going to give you another example here on the Reflex project. Um, so it's on Orkney, um, and we're trying to bring together a, a number of um, technologies here at the local level. Obviously, it's an island, so some challenges related to that. Um, and it's trying to bring together transport, heat and electricity solutions at the local level. And obviously, a key thing here is to optimise um, supply and demand uh, on, on the island um, and to work with the local residents uh, on the implementation of all of this. So light bulb moments from, from my end, um, this is what I think um, we have learned um, um, whilst running the program. Um, I think it's really important um, to look at the local delivery structures as part of, of these programs. So what we're finding is it's really, really important that the right local delivery structures are, are in place. Um, we often have uh, local authorities involved. They're often um, running projects for us, but also, uh, for example, um, projects where the, the private sector partner is the main lead. And it's really important to look at how these projects are delivered and the structures required um, um, to support um, the, the actual delivery. In that context, capacity and capabilities um, is, is really essential. Um, working quite a bit with the Energy Systems Catapult at the moment on a toolkit to set best practice um, in the sector and to help um, local authorities and what I would call local project developers um, to build capacity and also to build their capabilities in terms of implementing smart local energy systems. Um, the role of public finance, we obviously have the National um, Infrastructure Bank um, that's currently uh, being developed and um, there is huge potential um, to bring in private um, sector investment into these smart local energy systems. The challenge at the moment is um, that um, these projects are complex and investors are quite used to investing into asset classes, not into uh, sort of complex local um, uh, energy projects. So it's quite a, a big piece of work um, to do to bring um, you know, our projects together with investors. Um, we are doing this through an investor panel, um, starting to look at this and unlock uh, private sector investment. Incentivizing the delivery of smart local energy systems to move forward from a national to a more decentralized system, I think is a really important point as well. Uh, what we were finding across the program is that um, uh, local energy markets are important. You want to incentivize um, how you optimize um, supply and demand at the local level. And it's probably fair to say that uh, we haven't yet moved as far as we could uh, move uh, in this country in terms of uh, in terms of doing so. Um, and finally, fostering community participation. Um, I think it's come um, across in uh, the presentation of my uh, predecessor. Um, really important. Without um, people buying into the um, technology solutions, um, we will not achieve a net zero world. 
Thank you very much. And I apologize again for my presentation moving around. I don't know why that is, apologies. Thanks, Marika. Um, great stuff. Thanks for giving an insight into what's going on in the programme. And yes, apologies everyone for the uh, slight technical glitches going on there, but um, hopefully you all heard from Marika at the very least of uh, what was going on there. I think Marika will pick up some questions in the Q&A session later, if that's okay. Great, no worries. Yeah, good stuff. <laughs> um, key to questions coming, there's some really good stuff coming in on the Q&A uh, on the Q&A forum, so please do keep those coming and we'll try and get to those at the end. Right, what about data digitalization, and how's that going to um, change the way that we can optimise our energy system? Over to Gavin Starks, CEO of Icebreaker One, who's at the forefront of trying to open up our data system uh, for, the, for the energy and net zero world of the future. Over to you, Gavin. Good morning, everyone. Uh, very good to meet you all. And uh, please do keep uh, the questions coming on the chat. I um, want to talk a little bit about data today. And uh, the, the theme here was data is king. I'd, I'd start by saying data has no value unless it's connected to something else. So the, the theme here I'm going to sort of keep picking up on is we've got to work out how to connect data across all systems. And this isn't just about uh, the energy sector, if we look at the uh, data value chain here, we're looking at asset level information. Uh, we need to access to the geospatial information, the environmental data, climate data with our net zero uh, objectives and uh, policy and regulatory data. So there's a huge shift happening, not just in the digitalization of our energy systems, but in how this information will be used across sectors. So not just within the energy sector, but across water and transports and the built world and agriculture, but also how that ties into our net zero targets. Uh, and I'm sitting here in Glasgow at uh, COP and a whole raft of announcements, obviously, uh, including <clears throat> just last week that now 40% of the world's assets will be aligned with the Paris Agreement. So there's a whole um, hundreds of different reporting standards coming to market. So the need for data here to be shared, to be interoperable, uh, to be usable by many different uh, types of stakeholder is really paramount. And if we look at you know, what is that data ecosystem, <clears throat> the, um, uh, there's a whole range of data suppliers, including the assets themselves. We've got sensors uh, right down to the uh, asset level. Uh, where uh, the, the assets themselves should be query, queryable uh, using open systems and, and millions of uh, data users ranging from the data assets themselves will have to talk to each other using uh, various sort of machine interfaces, but also looking at huge numbers of business applications. We've already heard about the uh, applications there for flex markets and variable pricing and agile pricing. That's the beginning of a journey, not, not the end of a journey. So I think we'll, we'll see a huge amount of innovation uh, around those areas. As I mentioned, the uh, vast amount of um, information required to drive investment into this space. So providing information back to the investment community. How are we going to prove that our investments are net zero and are, and, and are not just uh, you know, um, ending up with uh, pushing towards renewables or pushing towards clean technologies, but actually proving that they're going to be net zero outcomes. So there's, there's thousands of applications here for uh, engineering, and it's really sort of there's a, a mashup here of the financial community and the engineering community to say, how are we going to fund this transition to net zero and to a digitalized uh, economy? We've mapped out over 9,000 organizations in the UK just working in the energy sector alone. So there's a thing, a que big question in here about how can we unlock data sharing at scale? And so what we've been thinking about here is what's the trust framework for that? If we're going to push towards uh, open and interoperable systems, uh, similar to what we've now got within banking, there's open banking as a standard, which enables data sharing across the financial community. How can we, uh, what can we learn from and how can we bring that learning forward into the energy sector to create cohesion across the market? It's one thing to have interoperability between systems where people have <clears throat> open APIs and open um, systems that can talk to each other. It's another thing entirely to have cohesion across an entire marketplace. 
And so a lot of our focus here is about how can we create cohesion so that everybody's working to clear and common rules, and they're not just technical rules, they're also uh, legal rules and um, governance rules around the sharing of information uh, between organizations and institutions that need it. Um, so they're looking at what are the framework uh, data rights, the liability transfers, the modes of redress, uh, if uh, things go wrong around that data sharing, a lot of this um, <clears throat> information is not going to be open. Some of it will be. And there's a, obviously a huge push through the Energy uh, Digitalization Task Force to, to push more data to be properly open. But there's a, a, an open access component to this where data needs to be made, um, commercial data needs to be made available to a very wide number, a very large number of actors in a standardized way. So there we need a, some form of control, some form of access control that says these people can access this information for this kind of purpose uh, and uh, have the control structure around that. So what we've been developing through, uh, initially funded by the MEDA program um, is open energy. And that does uh, three things. Uh, one is it, there are uh, two frontline services. There's an energy data search engine. So how can we even find what is out there? You think this is a solved problem? It's not. Um, there's lots of great work going on uh, around the, uh, across the country, uh, but in order to get data accessible, we need to know that it ex exists. So one of the calls to action for everybody working in the uh, energy sector and, and across sectors is to publish machine-readable metadata, so data that describes the data you've got, in an open format. If you do that, then the search engines can find it, and we can include that in the open search engine that we've been developing. Now that applies to both open data and commercial data. So even if you've got data that you sell out to the marketplace um, or, or you want to restrict access to, publishing the metadata around that will enable people to discover it, including us. Uh, and then we can come along with the second uh, service component here, uh, which is around access control, which is maintaining um, exactly what it says on the tin, who is allowed to access this information. And the third component of what we're doing here uh, is um, probably the most important one, is actually convening industry uh, around what are the actual user needs. Uh, there's, uh, we've got a series of advisory groups and steering groups, which includes industry, includes Innovate UK, Bayes, uh, Ofgem and are, are an observer on the steering group as well, to work out you know, how does this or how might this play uh, with the regulatory space. But under, underpinning all of this, we're trying to develop open standards. But again, not just technology standards. What are the standards for data governance? What are the standards around the legal frameworks and the operational frameworks? We're bringing together those user needs, the uh, common uh, co and cohesive needs of the marketplace, and then trying to codify them in a way that can really work and help the uh, sector scale. This is really supportive and connected to lots of other initiatives. So when we look at the interface with um, uh, the national data strategy, the industrial strategy, right the way through to international efforts, uh, there's a group called Mission Innovation, where, which is uh, co-chaired by China, Italy, and the UK. Uh, the UK is leading the secretariat there on uh, data and interoperability. Um, so we've got uh, an opportunity here to not just look at the, the UK innovation space, but look at the international innovation space. If we can get some of these open standards and open innovation uh, principles baked into the systems at the outset, there'll be a lot of wins down the line. And I think just to, to play the other side of that card, the risk at the moment is that there's a lot of commercial companies trying to create data monopolies or trying to create lot systems, even though they might be interoperable, they're not necessarily cohesive and, uh, and open to the entire marketplace. So we've got a, a, very, um, we're at a very interesting moment in history uh, where a lot, of, as we digitalize all of our systems here, where are the new monopolies going to exist and how can we make sure that there's a fair and open marketplace that is commercially viable for all actors uh, within it. So my, again, my call to action here is if you've got data, it will increase in value the more it's connected. So rather than collect, connect. So connect, don't collect is our sort of call to action. Um, this is part of a, an icebreaker one uh, program. Uh, we're an independent nonprofit uh, that is helping uh, make data work harder to de deliver net zero. And we're going to be rolling out the uh, principles and practices of, of the open energy 
programme now across these uh, different areas, uh, such as transport, to help create market-wide interoperability uh, on a B2B uh, basis. Back to you, Rob. Great, thank you so much, Gavin. Um, great presentation. Connect, don't collect. You heard it here first. Um, I like it. Just a real quick one, Gavin. You gave a bit of an overview um, at the end there about you know, how we're approaching this in the UK and what all the different parties involved in it are. Um, how, how, how does the UK progress on this compare with others internationally? Are there real leaders in this field that we can learn from? I, th I think the UK or, or is ahead. At the forefront? Yeah, I think, I think the UK is at, at the forefront of this. So we led the charge on open banking and partly because we open sourced the standards, it's now been copied in dozens of countries around the world. There's a lot of interest now. I think it's it's kind of set a, a, a few wheels in motion where organizations around the world are, are looking at you know, the, the benefits of open approaches uh, and open initiatives. Um, I think the thing that's really quite unique about the UK is that our regulatory frameworks and the um, uh, government frameworks sit very close to industry in a way that you don't necessarily see in other uh, jurisdictions. So there's a real um, benefit to the UK of, of bringing the public sector and private sector together to maximize interoperability and cohesion across marketplace that is quite hard to do in some other uh, territories. There's quite, you know, there's more maybe competitive uh, relationships between the public and private sectors. And I think the UK has got a lead here in terms of our um, size uh, and the ability to convene people. Um, you know, there's um, so European projects where as soon as you're trying to do more than one country at a time, it naturally takes 10 times longer. Uh, and we've, we've been observing this with the, uh, the mission of innovation piece. However, if we can use the UK as a demonstrator again here, it will serve as well, both in terms of our domestic uh, innovation, but also helping to export that uh, that value to other countries. Great stuff, thank you. So real opportunity for us actually by being able to use that close coupling of public private and potentially our, our, our agility compared to yes. other places as well. Super, thanks Gavin. More from you later, I'm sure. Um, next up, I'd like to invite Chris Koenig to come and talk. Chris is the programme manager for the new Strategic Innovation Fund which um, is funded by Ofgem, but run by Innovate UK. And we've invited Chris today because the networks and our infrastructure are so critical in how we can deliver net zero in the future. And this new strategic innovation fund will be key in helping the networks to innovate in the right way and to develop the systems in the future. Over to you, Chris. Thank you, Rob. And just checking that you can see my slides okay. We can, yes. Perfect. So good morning, everyone. My name is Chris Koenig. And as Rob said, I am the programme manager at Innovate UK for the new Strategic Innovation Fund. This is a fund that is aiming to unlock greener ways to heat and power your homes and businesses and vehicles by harnessing the power of innovation whilst keeping bills as low as possible. Now, pipes and wires aren't necessarily things that people often think about unless they work with them, yet they're incredibly important and provide a vital service that we rely on for almost everything in our daily life. Take a cup of tea, for instance. This great British institution would not be half as popular if you had to go down to the local stream to collect your water, gather wood to create a fire to boil your water, and not to mention the faff of making a cup and a tea bag and the rest, if we didn't have easy access to gas, electricity, and all the, what we may see as basic human rights, but our facilities. Now that I've got you all thinking about you quite fancy having a cup of tea, please don't pop off and make one just yet. The UK energy system is complex, with a lot of the design work baking, dating back a hundred or more years ago. In 1812, the gas industry was born, whilst Britain was still at war with Napoleon, supplying coal gas to the lights, of streets, lights in the streets of Westminster. In 1925, Lord Weir created a central electricity board to link the UK's most efficient power stations with consumers, which was called a national gridaron to standardize the nation, nation's electricity supply and what we now know as the national grid. 
but the phrase global warming wasn't first published until 1975. So it's not surprising that the majority of our energy infrastructure has not been designed with zero carbon energy generation and distribution in mind. And when I mean that, I mean from generation through transmission to distribution to your homes and businesses. You may have been a keen observer over the past few days and weeks of COP26 discussions or seen on the news the recent government strategies around heating our homes, moving away from natural gas to alternative methods such as heat pumps or potentially in the future hydrogen. But to make sure that we can run a heat pump, charge our electric car, keep the lights on, we have to make sure that the underlying infrastructure is fit for purpose through whole systems thinking, digitalization and smart flexible management. With the Strategic Innovation Fund, we're building a green energy system which is crucial to help cut out harmful greenhouse gas emissions. We need a culture change in energy that innovates with extreme urgency if we're to reach the government's targets of net zero and tackle climate change. We need to take urgent steps to reduce emissions, to deliver value to consumers and to make a difference. Energy networks underpin our move to net zero carbon emissions and this new £450 million strategic innovation fund will help us find cheaper, faster and more reliable ways to do this while saving consumers and all users of the energy networks money in the long run. It's funded by you and me and anyone else who pays a gas or electricity bill. And as we are the investors, it's vital that the projects funded deliver value, paving the way for net zero at the lowest cost. In addition, we recognise that the UK is an amazing place to be an innovator. The strategic investment approach is rarely, if not ever, seen in any other country across the world. This fund is a catalyst, aligning different pockets of energy innovation funding from public and private sector to make the UK the best place in the world for inno innovative energy businesses and academics to grow and scale their ideas and enterprises, leading to UK jobs and economic growth. We want the UK to become a magnet for energy investment, leading to national and international opportunities, all whilst delivering for our most important stakeholders, you. With a new, without a new generation of innovators flooding in to tackle the problems across our energy system, we will fail in our net zero mission, and we cannot afford to fail. Work has already started. The first innovation competitions looking for ideas, the discovery phase, launched at the end of the summer and closes on the 17th of November. For this phase, we have set four challenges for network innovation, which are focusing on whole system integration, data and digitalization, heat and zero emission transport. Energy network companies are busy right now working with other innovative businesses and entrepreneurs to submit their proposals in these areas. We are looking for big ambitious ideas to transform the energy network in the future. Projects that can really make a difference and support the delivery of net zero. But to get different outcomes, we need to take a different approach. The Strategic Innovation Fund requires all projects to aim to being embedded in our networks as business as usual. This means rapid de-risking of highly innovative ideas and onboarding of investors early on in the process to support growth and scale at the end of projects. We recognise that innovation is an adventure into the unknown and things will not always pan out the way we expect them to. So capturing lessons learned and feeding them back into the process means that A, consumers' money isn't wasted, B, others don't repeat the same mistakes, and C, it helps to inform other approaches. After all, there is value in all outcomes, expected or not. Policy regulation and innovation should work hand in glove, and strategic coordination and alignment with government, Ofgem, UKRI, and the energy networks will ensure we are pooling our efforts and effect effectively tackling the issues. But high performance innovation is not just about the energy networks, it's a whole system challenge. It is about pipes and wires, but it's also about you and your behaviour. If you're an innovator, do look for the Strategic Innovation Fund and come forward with your ideas over the following months and years. If you're from an energy company or policymaker, foster innovation and help drive our networks to change for the better. And for all of us, we need to understand how we use or store energy and look for better low carbon ways of living. We either get there together or we won't get there at all. We simply do not have the time to sit back. We have to start right now. Every day we delay, the harder it becomes. Thank you very much for listening. Great, thanks, Chris. And, you know, this is a really exciting new uh, launch of a funding programme. And I think if we can 
get that sweet spot that you just described of commercializing really ambitious network innovation um, will have done something extraordinary. So um, good luck with it all. You said that the first set of competitions are literally just about to close in a week's time. Um, what's what happens next and you know how do people how do innovators get involved if they're not a network company directly yeah it's a really exciting time rob um so as soon as our competitions finish so this is the discovery phase that we currently got there so we are looking for those blue sky thinking as i said high risk um and really kind of taking almost things to the extreme if, if if we're going to make a change we need to make some really big innovations um so we're looking for some you know significantly ground shifting um innovations coming through once the discovery phase has started so these projects that are applying now they're due to start sort of March time next year, um, they will then be moving through the different stages. So after discovery, we then move into, which is kind of like a high level feasibility study, we then move into alpha, which is looking um, essentially at that sort of proof of concept, sort of taking what you think you know in the feasibility study and kind of like uh, putting it into action. And then that will go into the beta stage, which will be uh, funded projects next year, which will be our big demonstrators. And they could be anything, you know, sort of, we're, we're looking serious amounts of money, millions of pounds, up to five years in, in development, um, in order to get these large scale demonstrators that can then be embedded into business as usual. But at the moment, we've got those four innovation challenges. Um, and at the beginning of next year, we're going to start the process again on looking at what the next set of innovation challenges are. So we're not just saying, oh, these are the four problems that we need to solve. We know that there's a lot more out there. We just thought we'd go with some, some big chunky ones that allow the networks to kind of get their, their nails into. Um, and then we'll be starting um, uh, yeah, the innovation challenge uh, rounds again, looking at describing what are the other challenges that we need to be addressing. Great, thanks Chris. So plenty of opportunity to get your innovation involved in, in, that, um, in the future. Um, as that progresses. Good stuff. Thanks a lot, Chris. Um, our last speaker is Cheryl Hiles. Cheryl is um, Director of Energy Capital, who are looking at the development of energy across the West Midlands Combined Authority region. And Cheryl also leads one of the design projects in the program I run, um, the Regional Energy System Operator program for uh, for Coventry and to expand into the into the West Midlands. So we're going to hear a bit about all of that from Cheryl now. Over to you, Cheryl. Thanks very much, Rob. I'll just hopefully share my screen with everybody. Is that working? Yeah, it looks good. Lovely. Right. Hello. Welcome, everybody. Um, thanks for having me. I've been asked here today to talk a little bit about um, building a smart, integrated future energy system for the West Midlands. Um, so I'm going to cover a couple of things as quickly as I can, um, given that we've only got a few minutes, um, which are who we are, what we mean by this, how we're going to try and do it, and why it's really important to us. So I'm Cheryl Hiles, I'm Director of Energy Capital based within the West Midlands Combined Authority. We are a partnership of people um, working together collaborati collaboratively at the local level to um, see essentially how we can make sure that we've got the necessary investment and powers to deliver um, regional energy plans and strategies. Um, and for us, smart local energy systems are absolutely fundamental to that. And I'll explain why as we go forward. Um, as Rob said, we're also part of a um, project that's funded through the Prospering from the Energy Revolution programme. It's a design project, so specifically looking at a technical design, uh, market design, and importantly, the institutional design um, for projects that would, um, will help make smart local energy systems something of the future. We're nearly finished, um, and it's quite exciting to be able to take you through some of the, the learning that we've um, found over the last two years. So, Essentially, there's two key things that we want to um, share as a result of the project. And that is we've done um, detailed cost benefit analysis, um, looking at the design that we've come up with. And essentially, the, the top level um, answer is there is definitely value, uh, demonstrable economic value in taking a whole systems approach um, to planning 
for energy, planning our energy system. So what I mean by that is taking a whole systems approach. Um, as we talked about already today, this means bringing the right people around the table and linking up processes. It can't be done in isolation. It can't be done in the silos that um, many of us have seen the energy system and other systems working in, in the past. Um, it does mean that we need also to go further than just talking and um, collaborating, but making sure that if we um, develop local area energy plans, for example, which look at what you really need to see happening in a local area from an energy perspective, that needs to be affecting the decisions of the investors who are actually taking um, the key investment decisions which will enable some of these programs to, to, to be delivered. And in terms of unlocking investment in energy schemes um, in local places we the mark has already referred to it's really important that we reduce risk and uncertainty um, because at the moment that is what's hampering a lot of the decision making the complexity of these projects there is also demonstrable value that we've identified in taking a local based approach in the way the system is actually operated so not just thinking about how we plan it and understand what goes where and how it all works but how the market actually works and um, Sam spoke a little bit about this before in terms of understanding the opportunities produced by a local flexibility market where local pricing is used to um, enable certain behaviours. But what is really important for us is the understanding that we could um, use the assets that are involved in um, decarbonising our buildings and decarbonising our, our vehicles and all the things that you have in, in an urban area that need um, to be focused on for, for us to achieve our net zero goals and making them part of the energy solution. So creating a market that helps with the economics of those investment decisions into vehicle to grid technologies, into um, battery storage within people's homes, as well as big batteries next to um, generation um, systems. So what, how do we aim to um, take advantage of this? In terms of local air energy planning, which is something that the energy systems catapult have been um, widely talking about, and it's something that government are understanding, um, that is, it would be a really important thing to do. Um, we've, there's a key issue that we've identified that really needs to be addressed and how that is resourced. Up until now, government hasn't said this is something that has to be done. They haven't made it a mandatory um, requirement because to be honest, it's hugely expensive and really complex. And as we've heard already today, there's lots of um, innovation projects that have been essentially doing that local energy planning process as part of their foundation for, for their pro project, but it needs resourcing properly. Um, we've realized that if you have particular vested interest funding that activity, it can um, lead to skewed outcomes. And so for us, we've basically looked through to say, well, where does the value sit? Is it in just in the planning or is it in um, more than that? And we've realized it's definitely in more than that. We need to make sure that anything that's planned and identified locally as an opportunity is built into the business plans and the business models that um, anybody who's responsible for energy infrastructure is involved in. So local air energy planning won't happen by itself. It's hugely complex. There's no statutory requirement on local authorities to actually do this. Um, and government have made it quite clear that they're not going to put that statutory duty on them. Um, so that means that the distribution network operators who we've spoke about, we've heard about already, um, those are the ones who are responsible for those pipes and wires, um, need to be um, engaging with local authorities and engaging with local government on what's going to happen. But actually, there's not the capacity within that local government to ensure that those the value of those conversations is really um, captured in the way that it needs to be. So we've got some um, a solution that we uh, think will work, and we've, uh, we're taking to off gem at the moment for, for a discussion. Um, Essentially, what we're saying is the solution to resourcing the issue could be a reallocation of responsibilities within the energy system. Um, and in terms of how that um, engagement and how that's funded, essentially, rather than funding the distribution network operators to talk to the local authorities, which is kind of what happens now, we need to see a capacity building within local government to be able to engage properly in a detailed planning process. So, um, and we think that the energy system can afford to pay for that process um, just through a reallocation of resourcing. 
in terms of how we deliver um, through a framework as well. So you might you need the money, but you also need a mechanism to, to deliver this. There's lots of policy going on at the moment, talking about um, zoning of local areas you might have heard about. Um, and uh, these things are all really important because they help to reduce project risk, which is what we've, we've seen um, with individual energy projects, not having that um, sufficient investable um, criteria to be able to be taking them forward. So, but decisions around what we do, where and how are actually quite, um, they're obviously technically very um, difficult, but they're also politically quite difficult. There will be winners and losers in any, any market, and we need to make sure that we are taking a just process to, through this transition. We're taking people with us and that we're mitigating any negative impacts of the decarbonisation process on um, the most vulnerable. So we think those decisions need to be made um, democratically um, and that if we can, our solution again to this is um, that the national policy framework and the associated funding that um, goes with that really does need to be to support integrated place-based solutions. But we also need often to make DNOs accountable to local areas in the supporting in supporting the identification of the best um, option in different places for decarbonisation, because that varies um, to a great deal, uh, to a great extent, right down to your substation levels, there's different solutions in different places. So just finally, for us, it's really important that we help national decision makers see the value of local energy system operation. Um, at the moment, it's very difficult to test that and prove it because of the way that um, sandbox te um, testing is set up quite often. So it's important for us to be able to show that it's no good just changing one bit. You have to change the whole thing to try and um, demonstrate the value that we've identified. But the critical thing is that if you want to decarbonize heat and transport systems, um, those aren't those decisions aren't economic at the moment. And there, nationally, you could make a decision, for example, to change the way that energy levies are um, put on um, our electricity and gas, which they're discussing now. Um, we could um, charge charge carbon for carbon appropriately. But those are big political difficult decisions. What we've seen through this project is there's an alternative approach where if you could actually involve all of those local assets in the energy market, it changes the economics of decision making for, at a local level for all of those sorts of schemes. So why this is important to us is particularly because the national system as it currently stands, the energy system doesn't really value the local um, economic value that perhaps local um, councils and local politicians do value. Um, but it is an important, but we've recognised that government also um, see that this is really important. So the levelling up agenda, which many of you have heard about, is making sure that um, we take everybody with us um, and everybody has the opportunity to um, benefit from green economic growth. So for the West Midlands in particular, we're a landlocked region. We have very little space for generating capacity. We have little opportunity for um, carbon capture and storage. Um, and making the economics of decarbonisation measures more economically viable is absolutely critical for the sustainability of our business and our industry. Else they're going to move away to where you can find that electricity or gas cheaper um, somewhere else. Um, so to achieve our green growth ambitions, it's absolutely fundamental that local energy systems are enabled. So we need government to seriously consider the impact of decarbonisation on the geography of the UK and actually enable smart local energy systems through their policies. Um, that's all from me. If you'd like to find out any more, we um, are working as part of the COP26 programme. We've got a West Midlands event um, taking place on Thursday. So you can find more details at that link there. Thank you very much for listening. Many thanks, Cheryl. Um, really great to see the results of that project coming to fruition now. You know, really at the at the heart of the hard yards of, of net zero here. How do you actually make things happen on the ground in an integrated way? Um, and I think the benefits you're talking about in terms of levelling up in these local areas are really important. And um, we'll be interested to compare your findings with some work that PwC are doing for us at the moment, looking at exactly this, because it has been a bit of a a gap in our evidence, our data, I think, of what is the effect on local economies mm -hmm. trying to deliver net zero in those places. So I think we'll, we're, we're starting to produce some really good um, new evidence in those areas. Yeah. Just a, a really quick question from me, you know, when you're looking at how to do this in reality in a planned way, mm -hmm. some of the really hard things like 
energy efficiency and retrofit, you know, protection of vulnerable customers. Mm -hmm. um, how does that get incorporated into planning? And are you seeing ways of delivering that in a, uh, as part of your sort of regional system operator model? Yeah, absolutely. So for, for us, one of the key things is the just transition and making sure that we take people with us and that nobody's left behind in that process. And one of the values of developing a systems operator approach at a, a local level is that you can make sure that um, investment is targeted because you're really clear on where things are going to happen, where the impacts are going to be felt. So, for example, if um, at a certain substation geography, you can see that we need to electrify um, because that, that's the best option in that area. There's no opportunity for using waste heat or anything like that. Um, actually, in that case, you need to really work, as you say, on the energy efficiency um, of those buildings um, and make sure that they're all suitable for that sort of solution. Um, when you've got local government involved, you know the people and the communities that are involved in that, that sort of um, decision. So you can make sure that the programmes that are supporting them are tailored. So it is really important that, for example, we work with the eco programme and that isn't something that's sort of set, set separately somewhere else. And you bring all of those things together in a local area. Mm, interesting. So, yeah, ability to kind of prioritise locally and, and actually sort of hyper locally. Um, yeah, because that's where the value is seen. You, you see the value in other aspects of um, local um, decision making and, and local budgeting um, that, that it's very hard to put a, a value on. Um, that would be great. We have looked at seeing if you can actually map that value um, for all the sort of co-benefits that are achieved, but it's quite a difficult thing to do. Great, thank you, Cheryl. Right, well, that brings us to the end of our talks from all the speakers and what a great set of views of the, um, of the, the ways of decarbonising our, our system those have been. I'm going to bring everybody back in now and we've got half an hour to um, discuss, to ask some questions and to um, try and put all this together a, a little bit in thinking about how our energy can become more sustainable um, in the future. So welcome back everybody. Thanks very much for your talks. Um, I'm going to kick off just with a quick question about outcomes. Now Cheryl started to touch on it just there, but if your view of kind of how the best way to decarbonize our lives um, is, is followed, what are the difference in outcomes that we can deliver for society if we do net zero well uh, versus doing it in a slightly disjointed and piecemeal way? Um, who wants to have a go at that? Gavin? Yeah, I think this links to one of the questions that was raised in the Q&A. I think this was linked to one of the questions in the Q&A. Um, about if we electrify all heating and all transports, uh, what's the impact on, on energy supply? Uh, and that takes us my very uh, high level understanding is if we were to do that tomorrow, we need to increase the amount of renewable energy supply by a factor of three or four. So the call to action there is actually to say, well, just focusing on increasing renewable energy supply is only part of the problem. We need to radically increase our energy efficiency. So if we were to double the amount of energy, uh, renewable energy supply and double the amount of energy efficiency, we'd hit our net zero targets. And the energy sector has to hit, I think just under 50% of the 2050 targets by 2030. So we've got about two and a half minutes of time between now and the, and the end of the decade to actually get in place all of the systems and processes and things and unlock a huge swathe of innovation and to me obviously the the one of the enablers of that is to really unlock the information flows so that people can work out what's working de-risk the investments so that the capital can flow into the kinds of solutions that people are uh, uh, talking about here but it we need to take a systems-wide approach to really unlocking that that holistic innovation but the the objective outcome should be let's let's double our energy efficiency and double our energy supply. 
so we we can build an efficient much more Fantastic. efficient system as a result thanks kevin cheryl yeah i think for citizens and um people at home they're clearly looking now for to understand what they can do and at the moment that it's still feels a little bit um, superficial what you can do to help um, with the kind of fight against climate change if if you're an individual and it feels like some of the big things that we're asking people to do aren't economic they don't make any sense for them and they're very difficult and um, things like retrofitting your homes and, and that kind of thing you know being able to shift to an electric vehicle um, they're all they're all quite challenging um, and you know for, for the everyday person they've got a lot of other things to, to worry about and this perhaps isn't the top of their list when you know they've got other uh, more pressing um, concerns so I think if a good outcome would be to enable those people to be able to participate and really feel that they're um, making a difference without actually having to do very much themselves um, because we talk about how we, how much we want people engaged in the energy system and I, ultimately people want to be engaged as little as possible generally they want to be able to do things simply easily have a big impact for not too much um, input and if we could get to a place where the economics of some of those decisions were a lot better that would really help um, if we could get to a position where aggregators are making, um, so organisations and companies are doing things for you um, and they're really maximising the value of local um, energy markets without um, too much impact on your life. So you know, if somebody turns your freezer off for a, a half an hour, it doesn't make any difference to you, but you've got an app and you're saving money and you're being able to say all my electricity is clean, etc. You feel like you're really contributing. So I think from a societal point of view, we need to get to a point where um, the system enables participation, but participation in the way that um, people are able to, um, to, to give the system, if that makes sense, because energy is never really going to be top priority unless it's a huge cost. And um, we don't nobody wants to see, see that because that obviously has huge implications for, um, for fairness across society. Thanks, Cheryl. Yeah, that, um, there were some headlines the other day about people's general unwillingness to change lifestyle to decarbonize their lives um which is some research done alongside cop i think and yeah that does play to that kind of view doesn't it that we will need to do quite a lot of stuff for people we can't expect the kind of you know the early adopters that we see um taking very active roles in the energy system at the moment we can't expect everybody to do that it's just not realistic that the other 95 percent of the population is going to kind of take that attitude as well so we are going to have to optimise for people, I think. Any other views on outcomes of, um, of uh, decarbonisation? Sam, yeah. Um, so, yeah, very well put, Cheryl. And, and I agree, we, um, you know, we need to be careful when we think about kind of using forerunners and people like us as models, because it's kind of, you know, you can go down the, the alleyway of, of thinking, oh, what we really need is everyone to become kind of, you know very energy literate and in a ver in a version of that literacy which is about kilowatt hours and and all of that kind of thing but actually i think i see engagement and participation i think there is a role for knowledge and literacy but that maybe starting from where people are um you know people actually have a lot of knowledge about how to stay how to achieve comfort in their homes um and and it, but you know you don't need to know about kilowatt hours to do that or um you know or how how to drive efficiently or you know how to get the best out of your vehicle and all of those kinds of things so in a way i think people are engaged in the energy system just not in the geeky way that we might think about it um and and i think that there are so so i think i i that's why I was trying to say that there's this spectrum. And I think when we when we think about the 95% that we might need to automate for them, we mustn't go too far and think that, you know, they are just completely passive agents here. Um, actually, there are real problems with trying to try and kind of think, get all excited about artificial intelligence fixing everything. Um, we need engagement. And I think there are lots of co-benefits to com community participation, for example. Um, so when what I've been doing in, with my social housing tenants participants is talking to them about what 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 communities do they feel part of and that might be neighbors like how many neighbors do you do you ever talk to about energy and the answer is oft, often quite a few um and but also other like you know you might be part of a, a sports uh, or a religious uh, community or even an online community and actually these um you know it, 
infiltrating kind of ideas around net zero into communities can have a much bigger impact so so yeah it's it i just warn against that kind of um binary opposition between literacy and not non-literacy i guess very good point um, Rika. yeah um i would just um also be a little bit cautious about that really um and I'm, i'd like to pick up one of the questions in the chat as well if that's okay rob around education about energy solutions and community engagement, you know, how do you do that in practical terms? I think there's room for a lot more of that. And I think the two key words for me are consultation, consultation and empowerment. So, um, and I think we've seen with the PFA program, you know, some, some of the projects where we had um, high community involvement, um, that if you consult um, well at the local level with local communities, uh, then usually the um, outputs and the outcomes of a project are a lot better because you deliver a solution that's fit for purpose for what um, sort of local people would like to see. It's hard, not easy, okay, um, and you have to put quite a bit of effort into it, but if you do it well, uh, I think you get better outcomes and, and outputs and um, the second thing is empowerment and that's not an easy one okay how do you do that how do you start off and we've talked about the early adopters um key to work with the early adopters i think you know to start it all off but but then how do you move on you know how do you reach groups that you haven't thought about yet and 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 i think there's huge need to um, focus more on this, you know, there's only um, small amounts of money available normally for community groups at the moment to um, develop their own sort of projects and programs and actually it's not that difficult to do and, and if um, community groups start to develop their projects then there's a lot more involvement usually at the local level in terms of delivery of these projects and, and so I think um, it's it's looking at that and how we can foster that more is, is for me the key thing in all of this. Um, and, you know, it's small steps. Um, I totally um, acknowledge that, but I think it could grow a lot bigger um, if, if there was a bit, a bit more of a focus on this overall. Hey, thanks, Monica. Yeah, it's interesting that there's a lot more talk, isn't there, of kind of putting the consumer at the heart of the transition um, in the last year. and trying to integrate design principles in the way we care about these things. And I think if you can do that, it automatically makes you take a whole systems view of the system behind the consumer that's delivering that service. Because you have to think about the physical networks, you have to think about the way consumers are being charged through the suppliers, you have to think about the cost stack, the value stack all the way through that system, right through to generation you have to think about efficiency as well because that clearly helps save the consumer money so i think we're going to need to look through the through the eyes of the consumer a lot harder at how we optimize our system in future um chris do you want to add some thoughts yeah i was just going to say so as part of the strategic innovation fund we've we've actually setting up a consumer panel um to assess the, the the way we're, we're sort of developing our innovation challenges and how best to engage consumers in the projects that we're funding so sometimes it's not appropriate but as you said Rob and 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 sort of Maraki mentioned as well it's really you know if you've got consumers at the heart of it then you are going to develop those better outcomes and I think it was Cheryl who said that you know we want to leave no one behind in the um, energy transition and and supporting vulnerable customers through through the whole uh, process and and rather than sort of dragging them through it but being led by them through it is a much better solution so we're very much thinking about you know how do we look at that kind of impact assessment from a vulnerability point of view with regards to the projects that we're funding specifically when we get to the demonstrator stage you know that is going to be quite a key part of the assessments that we will be doing mm -hmm. Can I come in there, Rob? Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think you're absolutely right, Christine. It's really important to consider consumers. And I think the energy system has done a pretty poor job in the past, if I'm honest, at um, sort of segmenting our consumers. Um, if, if you look at some of the other industries that really are consumer focused, um, there are a lot more different archetypes of um, customers, shall we say, than, than perhaps the energy system is used to, um, to dealing with. We talk about vulnerable customers and everybody else generally, and that's it. 
Um, so one of the things we're looking at in the West Midlands is doing um, developing a um, net zero neighbourhood um, concept where we're actually going into um, a community with um, with partners, so with those community groups, with the local authorities driving that and actually saying, okay, what, what works here um, to try and see whether, so as part of your kind of zoning and local energy planning process where you understand your community and you can see how different solutions might work for different um, well, communities, I think, because they are often significantly influenced by one another. So we talked earlier about where trust is, um, you know, is felt where where people get information from, um, and the, the sort of there is a the, there is definitely a, a variety of engagement points um, that we need to consider. And I think how we develop propositions around that is really important. But fundamentally, the system needs to enable it, um, and you know, you don't want to be saying, okay, we're going to put a whole load of um, ground source heat pumps in this street and we're going to work on the energy efficiency and then the network they actually is going to cost you this much because because of this um you know if the market enabled that flexibility locally then we could definitely um encourage the behavior that we need to see um, more effectively when it comes to a kind of place-based approach that's really interesting the, the segmentation um thoughts as somebody who worked in consumer goods in uh, an early <laughs> parts of my career you know, we used to spend huge amounts of time and money trying to understand very specific consumer segments of you know particular demographic age um, and places of, of, of living and you know attitudes to life and how that influenced their decisions on on um, what they bought in, in that case but yeah i think you're right we can learn so much more in really trying to understand what drives people and what they want out of their their energy system chris you want to come back in yeah, I was just going to say, and on that segmentation, um, we don't even have a, a definition for vulnerable customers who are, are non-domestic. So at the moment, there's, you know, the um, priority service register um, and, uh, and and there's eco, as, as Cheryl was saying, but there is nothing if you are a vulnerable business, it, it just doesn't exist. So there is definitely inequalities within our systems. Great. Thank you. All. Um, I'm just going to take one of the questions from the chat which is about you know how how do we um take this sort of concentrated skills and uh, experience that some of the demonstrators in our program have developed and which other you know innovation type programs tend to do and how do we spread that how do we scale skills that are going to be needed um to implement smart local energy systems across the country and how do we do that over time in a way that's sustainable and deliverable? Um, any thoughts on you know, skills from whatever angle you're, you're coming from? Uh, Sam, do you want to kick us off? Um, I was going to just say that, yeah, it, it's worth pointing out that uh, two of the three uh, demonstrators on the on the PIFA program are based in Oxfordshire and um, Oxfordshire has and, and Oxford City has been very very successful at, at winning funding um, for these kind of innovation type projects and and there is a, a, an uneven geography um, to this stuff and and so I know that the energy systems catapult are doing quite a lot of work on um, questions of repli replicability and scalability um, and I think for me I think you know, yes, it's about having universities involved and, and a supportive kind of civil society groups, which we have in Oxford. But I think that local authority is probably the key. And so developing capacity in local local authorities feels like they are the glue that, that brings everything together. So um, that none of that is particularly talking about skills, but of course, it's about having skills in each of these organisations, these institutions and, and how, how you um, develop that so they're sustained and they don't just depend on one individual being brilliant in a city council or something then these are huge challenges but a lot of work is is going on and, and being led in, in PIFA by the, the energy systems catapult. Gavin from a from a sort of digital skills point of view as somebody who's you know not from the energy sector um, uh, what do you see in terms of appetite for digital innovators to get involved in this sector and yeah, how, this, how do we build that as a skill set in the energy world yeah this is, this is a huge challenge for everybody working in the sector um that there's we just don't have enough uh, data scientists uh, coders and people who are uh, cognizant in the in the data landscape <clears throat> and um i really see this as 
quite a critical blocker uh, to some of the innovation that's needed, especially at scale. And there's been a few questions in the Q and A about scalability here, uh, and I think this is where you know, in the given the urgency uh, with which we have to move forward, I think there's a, a few different uh, principles we can apply. Uh, one is we can actually move faster together by sharing more information. So I think there, there's um, a lot of scope for collaborative fora, of getting people together to share how they're doing things. Uh, and, and particularly around the, the sort of organizational data maturity, which is very broad. There are organizations that have legacy, legacy systems here that have a mountain to climb ahead of them. Um, and at the same time, we're trying to uh, encourage <clears throat> and fund the development of digital uh, systems right the way down to the meter. So there's a, a huge amount of learning that has to be done. And I'd really encourage organizations to, to set up uh, explicit permission for their teams to go and talk with people that they might not ordinarily feel are competitors, just so we can move forward here. The competition will come in through other uh, areas, I think, but we've got to create the marketplace in order to get us to net zero. Uh, and that requires everyone to lean in. Uh, and with that, you know, to, to the earlier point, you know, follow the follow the geeks is always my, my challenge here. Find the alpha geeks and get them to communicate what they're doing. Uh, it will give everybody a, a leg up uh, as to what's um, going to help and what um, and where they can save months or in, in some cases years of effort. Interesting, Olivia. Are you an alpha geek? Just so, just so I can spot one. I'm. I'm not sure if uh, if you can self classify. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. But, right. uh, but uh, I, th I think it's, it's something I was. Uh, uh, um, one of my previous businesses, we had a, one of our investors was uh, Tim O'Reilly, uh, who has led a lot of the open source uh, community uh, over the years and a lot of the innovator communities in, in uh, Silicon Valley. And he was always following the geeks. Now, find out what they're doing, get under their skin. That's what the future is going to be sooner than you think. Mm, interesting. And you made a really interesting point there about um, making sure we're competing in the right places as well. We're, we're encouraging competition in the right place. And I think one thing that the recent supply crisis has highlighted is just, you know, we're asking suppliers to compete in, in all the wrong places. Well, we're asking suppliers to compete on the basis of hedging wholesale um, power prices and energy prices rather than competing on delivering the best service to consumers. So I think this, this idea of trying to find the right areas for competition, in, especially in our um, regulated entities, is going to be really important in the future. Marika, you've got your hand up. Yes, just uh, to uh, maybe um, draw on a sort of, sort of talk about a, a slightly different theme here in terms of skills. Um, I think local tradesmen is a, is a really important um, thing to look at. And I think we know from delivering the prospering from the energy revolution that um, op operational capability is also really important in terms of getting the assets installed. Um, and I think we all know um, just from recent experience with, with heat pumps, et cetera, at the national level, heat pump um, sort of targets, that it's not that easy. And I, I would say that there is a need for a skills program for local tradesmen, people that really deliver the assets um, on the ground. Uh, because if you don't increase numbers there, then it's going, going to be really difficult to scale these projects, I think, in the longer term. Um, and I think that whole area just needs looking at and, and, and you know, um, needs action, I think. <laughs> I, I agree. Cheryl. Thanks, I was just gonna um, add, the way in which the skills um, providers think and um, work is quite interesting and it's useful to kind of understand. Um, and a lot of the time you get the message from them that you know if you provide the demand, we'll provide the training. Um, and I think one of the key things we've got to demonstrate is um, that there is this is a long-term trajectory and there are opportunities um, that will continue to come forward. Um, so looking at the examples of retrofit, for example, we still haven't quite convinced people that this is a, a market that's going to grow. Um, there's a huge opportunity, but the way that funding is allocated in it, it creates a boom bust 
um, situation, which means that people won't invest because they know that the market is not going to continue. So for us, we've talked about um, devolving responsibility into a place so that those local businesses and the local trades can see a programme of activity that they that it's worth investing in, um, because a lot of this stuff is local. So there are there's big skills things that we've talked about from data, which can be done anywhere. But actually, when you come down to your installers, you are talking about local local people working in local projects and um, and they need to see that local pipeline. So I think it's important to make sure we don't end up with that boom bust situation and that we look at all the different aspects of the decarbonisation process from kind of your engineers who are working on the offshore market. And there's clearly um, a programme of activity there. It makes it worthwhile investing. There are ele other elements of the transition that perhaps don't have that certainty that we do need to provide. Indeed. Um, Chris? Yeah, I was just going to say, so not really necessarily on figures, but we're looking at innovation cultures within our networks and what importance and how important that role is actually. Um, so alongside that, we're also looking at a, a potential graduation scheme for innovation, energy, energy innovators, because as I said in my in my uh, presentation, you know, it's it is all about kind of, you know, what we have now is what will likely see us through for the next 10 years, but we need the fresh ideas, we need the fresh blood coming through and having a, a graduation scheme that specifically targets energy innovation um, will hopefully be able to uh, to feed into that innovation culture going forward and bring those new ideas forward as well. Yeah, great. I, I think that's so true, isn't it? We just need the, we need the brightest minds um, thinking about this, you know, the whole, the whole energy system over the, over the coming decade and at the same time you know we need to be retraining our plumbers and our heating fitters um, in every local locality in the country um, it's just a huge a huge opportunity to, to get this right I, I'm amazed to find that we're out of time it's been an amazing discussion I feel like we could have talked all day about this and we've just scratched the surface um, but can I just thank all of you for your contributions today and for your um, you know, deep thoughts on how we get to net zero in a better way. Um, can I thank everybody for joining and remind you all that the last of these webinar series is on Thursday at 11 o'clock where challenge directors from various different challenges will be, um, will be taking part to give their uh, views on um, what they've learnt over the recent years in trying to address various different aspects of net zero innovation. So um, thanks very much everybody, um, we're going to call it a day there and I wish you all a very good rest of Tuesday. Bye for now. <laughs>